Uh, thank you. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, primordial density perturbations. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, some aspects of uh, primordial density perturbations, namely primordial features and non causalities that may be used to address uh, some of the questions that we would like to know, answer about uh, the beyond standard model cosmology. So these questions include, for example, was the primordial universe inflation or was it uh, alternative to inflation such as uh, contraction bounce models, bounce scenarios? And uh, if it's inflation, what was the details of the inflation model and dynamics? And uh, also what was the particle content of the high energetic primordial universe? So first, uh, primordial features. So what are the primordial features? So from experiment, we know uh, the density perturbation that we observe from CMB and large cell structures are approximately scale invariant. Um, the primordial features are some strong scale dependent deviations uh, from this overall picture. So uh, these are two random examples of what the features might look like. They are typically oscillatory uh, because the scale dependence is very strong. So otherwise you would break the scale invariance. <clears throat> so this uh, kind of uh, primordial features in terms of model buildings is actually quite natural in terms of uh, uh, UV completion of whatever primordial universe model that we are working on. So for example, if you look at the landscape of potential here, the picture is just two dimensional uh, landscape of potentials. In reality, perhaps we have much more fields and much more dimensions in the internal space. So even if we talk about uh, single field models, um, those models are some effective low energy trajectories uh, running at the valleys of the, those potentials. So, so the trajectory may have uh, sharp features, some kind of periodic features, and orthogonal to the trajectories, you might have a lot of uh, uh, massive fields, which could lead to some effects due to their oscillation. Um, in terms of uh, model buildings, um, the primordial features may be roughly characterized into the following uh, two to three kinds, uh, depend on the ingredients that we add in our models. Uh, sharp feature refers to a temporary deviation from a tractor solution or some main solutions if a scenario don't have a tractor solutions at some particular point in time during its evolution. Uh, resonant inflation by definition means uh, you encounter some oscillations around the tractor evolution with a frequency larger than the horizon scale uh, of your model, whichever model it is, inflation or non-inflation. Um, I will highlight a, another uh, type of features, which is a little combination, some kind of combination of a previous two in some cases, uh, which we call the primordial standard clocks. Uh, so those are the features imprinted uh, uh, by the classical and quantum oscillations of massive fields. So in terms of uh, their signals, the previously is a model building. In terms of signals, this model imprint in primordial spectra uh, these three, two or three types of uh, uh, feature models all have uh, distinct uh, signatures in terms of their primordial spectra. So sharp feature signals as a function of uh, wave number um, typically has a sinusoidal running. Tau zero here is just a constant. It's a time of the feature in your model. So K is the wave number. So this sinusoidal running is a, can be regarded as a signature of sharp feature if we see uh, in density perturbations. Um, in connection to the later part of talk, I will just emphasize here, although they are all oscillations, uh, this uh, sharp, although they may be connected, uh, for example, uh, massive field oscillation may be connected with the presence of sharp feature, the sharp feature running, the sinusoidal running alone is not a signature of any uh, massive fields or it, 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 it does not even depend on the scale evolution uh, 
scale factor evolution of your models. Namely, if, even if you have a non-inflation models, alternative to inflation models, and then you have a sharp feature, you will still see the sinus auto running. So this kind of properties is very model independent. And uh, this sinus auto running, of course, have a very highly model dependent envelope and the face that we did not capture here because it's highly model dependent. So each, for example, inflation, uh, each specific type of uh, sharp feature like kink, step, some bending trajectory, tack yang, for example, uh, they can all be characterized as sharp features. Um, they all have their own uh, different type of uh, envelopes. So this will be useful, um, for example, to reveal the details of inflation. The resonance feature signals uh, roughly runs also science orderly, but the uh, argument of science order function is uh, in terms of log k. We will have further insight about this later in, later in the talk. So these signals arise between, because there's a resonance between the background oscillations, which is uh, uh, at energy scale, at a frequency scale higher than the horizon scale of your models, and the infraton quantum oscillations, hence the name resonant features. And they are they also have, besides this uh, characteristic sign log runnings, they also have model dependent envelope and phase. Um, the third kind, which we call the primordial standard clocks, uh, the example I use here is, is actually uh, a classical primordial standard clocks, um, sort of combine these two features um, also drawn the motivation from the landscape picture that I motivated at the beginning of the talk, where the evolution of your scenarios has uh, two different stages. Uh, first, you have some attractor or main evolution stage. And then during the landscape, you encounter some sharp features, which can be uh, any of the features that I listed previously, like turning trajectories, tachyonic or interaction with some other fields, which temporarily uh, deviates uh, the field from its main trajectory. So this sharp feature alone will have its signature uh, because it deviates it from its main trajectories. Uh, some, in some cases, uh, that will excite a classic oscillation of massive fields and they will start oscillating. For inflation models, this oscillation will last for a few evos and before settling down. And this uh, leads to a, another set of predictions. So we, I will uh, use this uh, as example to illustrate the usefulness of the primordial feature models uh, in terms of probing the details of primordial universe. So this scenario is uh, uh, particularly interesting, especially perhaps the second part of the signals, because uh, these signals has some has can be can provide some interesting information uh, that uh, other approaches cannot. So those massive fields, uh, massive means the mass larger than the event horizon scale of primordial epoch oscillate in a very standard way, regardless of your background evolution. Uh, basically, it's harmonic oscillations. So it turns out these uh, harmonic oscillations uh, can be used as a clock uh, that providing ticks for the time coordinate T. So induce oscillation patterns in density perturbations as a function of K. So as I will show later on, this oscillations in density perturbations in terms of uh, uh, wave number k encodes directly the information of background evolution a of t hence the name uh, primordial standard clocks so here is a sketch of all what the signals might look like in different scenarios not different models just characteristic scenarios um, so, so this is only a sketch, not a concrete prediction, a full prediction of particular model, but it ca captures the main characters. So the y-axis could be the correction to power spectrum on non-causal energies here. 
here I plot the corrections to the power spectrum. The x-axis is the wave number. So the, the green line here are the, uh, the signatures induced by the sharp features. So you can see um, they are sinusoidal running and uh, they are sort of more or less similar in terms of uh, overall properties uh, for different scenarios. The blue lines are the signatures induced by the oscillation of mass field. And you can see they are different from different scenarios. For example, uh, the expansion scenarios, for expansion scenarios, uh, the wave number, uh, the, the, the wave, the periodicity increases as you increase the K, while for contraction scenarios, they decrease as you increase K. And for fast expansion scenarios, you typically see uh, much more ticks than those in the uh, slow evolution scenarios. So quantitatively, uh, you can show that if you have a background evolution, completely general background evolution parameterized by this power law with arbitrary P, the running of the, those clocks, clock signals will look like the following. Um, all this are constant. The most important uh, character of this signal is this uh, uh, sinusoidal argument here yeah, in terms of function of k. So those are the inverse function of a of t. So that means the phase pattern will be a direct measurement of a of t. And this kind of models and also in general the future models does have a little motivations from the current data, although our current data are perfectly consistent with uh, scale invariant spectrum with a little uh, running a little tilt. So um, here the plot, I show the CMB temperature residues from Planck data. And you can see overall it's uh, uh, consistent with, uh, with the absence of any features, but you still see some little glitches which people notice uh, in data analysis and model buildings. And those can at least serve as a, um, examples for us to start preparing uh, pipelines and data analysis in model buildings. Uh, because as I will show later, um, the experiment is going to improve. Uh, we will have much more precise data on density perturbations. So we hope some of them will stay or we will discover some new features. So uh, more, most prominently, we see uh, two glitches in this density perturbations, one in large scale, another in short scales. And uh, uh, this kind of two well-separated features may be connected by the standard clock effect that I reviewed previously schematically. And it could also be explained by some other feature models I, as I will mention briefly later too. So, uh, so here's an example uh, that we did uh, in collaboration with uh, Mattia Raglia, who is in the audience and Diraj Hazra recently uh, trying to build a full models as an exercise of uh, uh, anticipating uh, more high quality data in the future. A model that can simultaneously address uh, both of the features in the large scale and short scales, which actually uh, serve an illustration how the primordial feature models may be used to understand uh, the very details, a lot of important aspects of primordial universe. So uh, here is the top-down um, bird's eye view of the potential that we constructed. Um, uh, the Lagrangian that described this is written on the right-hand side, but you can ignore this for the short, uh, because, of the, because this is a short talk and uh, the mathematical form is just to capture the overall uh, shape of these potentials. So you can use some other mathematical form approximate as well, as long as they capture the picture well. So let's just describe the pictures um, in words. So um, the red part of this plot means uh, lower potential. So, so in this model, uh, you have two period of inflation. So this is the inflation model. Um, first, the infraton rose at the top of a plateau. Uh, that's triggers the first stage of inflation. And during its evolution, it uh, 
encounters a cliff and the rolling off the cliff and become a fast roll, short period of fast roll inflation. And uh, this fast roll inflation will shortly enters a curved path of a valley. And initially it overshoots the bottom of the valley and climbs on the side of a cliff. And this excites the classical oscillations um, around the minimum of the valleys. So you have a massive field start oscillating and decaying, uh, which settles down to the second stage of inflation. Um, so as you can see, um, there's a lot of details uh, building in these models. If you try to qualitatively change some of the details because of oscillatory nature of the predictions, uh, you will see uh, it already uh, disfavored by data. So um, the data is kind of very constraining in terms of uh, this model dependent uh, power model features. Also, uh, some aspects of these models are model independent, such as the last stage where the massive field oscillates and settle down to a second stage of inflation. So this model independent but scenario sensitive properties may be used to, uh, to, to probe the background evolutions, hence provide some direct, inf direct support or against or uh, for the inflation model, for the inflation scenario as a whole scenario. So, with this uh, models, here is uh, some data analysis. Um, the left hand side, left side is a uh, best fit primordial spectrons that uh, resulted from uh, these models. As you can see, uh, now here is a concrete predictions. It's a full predictions of a model. The separation of a sharp feature signal and clock signal and uh, the intermediate connections between them. So these models introduce six extra parameters. So it has some large, large chi-square improvement, but uh, a more proper way to compare these models because we introduce extra parameters is to calculate the Bayes factors. Um, as you can see, the Bayes factor is uh, consistent with zero. So despite of six extra parameters, uh, this model uh, is currently indistinguishable from the standard model. So here is a uh, posterior distributions um, of several, three of the important parameters in this model. And uh, as you can see, uh, this dip feature is the dip that we see in the large scales. So this a little bit bump is uh, a result of fitting that dip. And also the short scale oscillations um, seems to be fit by a massive field oscillations, uh, which has a mass of uh, around 18 times Hubble scale. So we checked this uh, data analysis with uh, a different set of uh, Planck data, which is published by two members of the Planck team in 2020, uh, which uses more sky coverage and uh, it, it's generally more powerful than the Planck 18 uh, release. Accused of some of the features, uh, but in these models we see, for example, if we concentrate on the last posterior distributions of mass of the massive field that we uh, picked up in the previous run, uh, we, with a slightly change of prior, just to check whether it's dependent on prior, you can see um, the Planck data has kind of two peaks, one around 10, another one around 18. And uh, this EG20 data release uh, still, the 18 one is still there. And the 10 one is also there, but a little bit disfavored. So anyway, so this is, uh, this, these peaks are not uh, data analysis. Uh, uh, pr a prior dependent uh, uh, phenomena, but some kind of fittings to the glitches in the data. So here is a intuitive view of how the best fit model is fitting, is fitting the data. Uh, here we include both the TT, TE and EE spectra. 
And as you can see, EU Spectrum now has a very large error bars. So it's uh, not too much constraining. Uh, the TT is the, the one that we started motivated us to, to construct these models uh, because we know some characters of all different, what the different kinds of features should look like in density perturbations. And, and you see back construction it indeed seem to fit uh, some of the things that we uh, start to address, started to address. Um, but also at the same time, you can see there's some correlated fittings in TE spectrum, which can only be seen by running and picking up the best feature, uh, best feed models, uh, running data analysis. It's, uh, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to foresee how those features are correlated between TT and TE. Uh, so the best part of this kind of exercise is in the future, uh, the data will be improved uh, in terms of order magnitude. So uh, this is mainly due to the experiments that trying to measure the polarizations of CMB. So there are a large array of uh, experiments that have been proposed to map out the polarization of CMB down to cosmic variance limit, uh, including both ground-based and satellite experiments. Um, most of these experiments have their have in their mind uh, trying to search and the re trying to search and constrain the B mode polarization. So in order to measure a constrain B mode polarizations, you have to understand the E mode very well. So all these experiments will measure E mode into an acquisite position because E mode is a foreground of B modes. Um, this is very good for us because we will use their E mode data because it's correlated for, uh, with the T mode prediction. So here is a forecast using uh, the last experiment. Uh, it's uh, just because this experiment, you, we also did with the previous other experiment, but I let me show just with the last experiment because uh, it's kind of give you a idea of uh, some of the um, ultimate experiments uh, will say will provide us uh, with the information about primordial, primordial universe. So for the same uh, best feed models, uh, we did indeed see a large improvement, not much in the temperature because Planck is already approaching the cosmic variance limit, but in the polarizations, especially in a large scale, for example, um, this uh, all scale satellite can map out the E modes and improve the error bars of emotes um, by, uh, by a factor of few and pin down the large scale features that any model predicts very well. Also, there are also uh, considerable, considerable improvement in the short scales in both TE and EE uh, that will help us uh, to improve the constraint in fact, in this models will either um, confirm or rule out uh, the best fit models that we presented previously. Also due to the authoritative natures of the, of the predictions, the mass of, of these particles can be measured if this is the model with a very, very, very precisely. <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned previously, so even if in the future, a primordial feature signal is discovered, uh, it's very likely that at the initial stages, you ha will have multiple possible explanations. I just gave one example, but there are also examples you can try uh, with both resonance features, pure resonance features and the shock features. And distinguishing between these different features and signals will be a very important um, activity. So I will, uh, due to the restriction of time, I will not, talk about for much, uh, just mention it. So also uh, uh, because of time, uh, I would like to just brief mention, um, I just mentioned the CMB experiments and the, all the correlated features, all the features that we talk about uh, will have a correlated feature signals in galactic distributions and also 21 centimeters from atomic hydrogen distributions in the cosmos. So those are also very interesting areas. 
and in some sense they will have more pro provide more potential data because they provide three dimensional data. So in the last part of talk, um, I will also mention. Let me mention some quantum aspects of um, the phenomena that that I talked about previously. So previously we were talking about massive field gets uh, excited by some sharp, sharp features and oscillating classically, uh, but more generically, even if this massive field sit at the bottom of potentials uh, in the primordial universe, it will still oscillate quantum mechanically. So for example, um, in the Tassida space, um, you have uh, uh, given Hawking temperatures. So if you have a particle with mass up to that scale, so they were quantum fluctuation, they were quantum fluctuating uh, considerably, and they may be produced on shell due to those fluctuations. And once they are produced, they can couple to infratons and leave imprints in the correlation functions of the infraton. So here we're talking about inflation scenario. So uh, these phenomena are more general than the classical oscillations, but uh, observational imprints become more subtle because at least for inflation, the quantum fluctuations does not break the scale invariance. So you have to look harder in higher point correlation functions. So which is the primordial non gauss entities that I mentioned at the beginning of talk. So in order to see the signals of those uh, features, um, let's look at the special limit of a, for example, three point functions in which um, the wavelength of a mode mediated by the massive field is very long. So this long wavelength fluctuations uh, of uh, quantum fluctuations of massive field at the long wavelength limit, limit behaves classical like. So it serves as a background oscillation for the shorter wavelength oscillations, quantum, quantum oscillations of the infraton modes. So this picture in this limit, this picture seems to be uh, similar to the picture that we presented previously, although it's uh, uh, three point functions and in quantum in nature, but the mathematics become uh, very similar, which is why um, we will see some very interesting uh, similar properties related to what we see previously. Now, in fact, uh, this has been generalized into a very general program uh, in which we ask a question, what are the signatures of all the intermediate states that pop up during the inflation uh, in the primordial density perturbations? So the answer is uh, uh, the, if we ignore the issue of observability for the moment, for a moment, so the mass and the spin spectrum of th all those intermediate states are encoded in some soft limits of non gauss energies. Uh, the squeeze the limit of the three point, namely bi spectrum, is just, a, just an example. Um, in this limit, the non gauss energies will approach to, to a form where it has some power law dependence on the ratio of the two modes, k long divided by k short. The power of this uh, power law encodes the mass spectrum and the angular dependence where theta is the angle between k long and k short is a Lagrangian polynomial with the index encode the information of spin. And also overall, you have an amplitude penalized by Boltzmann suppression if your mass is much larger than uh, the Hubble scale of, of the Tassida of the space. So this has been called the uh, Clyde physics, cosmological Clyde physics programs. And um, here is a uh, model independent features, but the amplitude of non gauss entities is very model dependent. So open for predictions from model building. Um, this programs has been applied to uh, many areas, including uh, generalizing it to more general effective field theory languages and strong couplings and trying to figure out um, the signatures of standard models in this setup, as well as uh, signals of beyond standard model uh, physics, such as uh, supersymmetry, ground unification theory, and higher spin fields. 
uh, many of the authors are in the audience as well. <clears throat> so uh, just to make a connection of this uh, programs with the one that we just mentioned. Because so far for the quantum ones, we have been talking about the inflation background. So we, the question to ask, what happens if you have arbitrary uh, background? In fact, uh, uh, very similarly, um, you can use this quantum oscillating massive field as a clock, uh, but now it's a quantum primordial standard clock. So if you use the arbitrary scale factor evolutions, you will find um, the non gaussian entities in the same squeeze limit will be a sinusoidal dependence on the, this argument. So the important part of this argument is it's uh, again, the ratio of K long versus K short, but the power law changes, uh, it's one over P. Similarly to what we see in the classical case, uh, this is a direct measurement of A of T. So we will have these oscillations now, instead of uh, scale dependent oscillations become a shape dependent oscillating signals. So to make a connection with the previous cosmological collider physics uh, programs, let's uh, look at the result of cosmological collider physics in a limit where M is larger than three H divided by two. Now in this limit, you have a imaginary power law here and we can rewrite this in terms of sinusoidal functions. And you see the previously, uh, the, the log feature, the log function that arises previously is in fact, in retrospect is due to the assumption of inflationary background because we start with inflation. So although it, it has not been mentioned uh, predominantly in the program of cosmological collider physics, um, I thought, there's a one information in this cosmological collider physics that is uh, even more interesting is that, that it, not, it measures not only in the particle spectrum, but they also measure the scale factor evolution of inflation background. And, and there's a direct evidence for inflation scenario uh, if this kind of signatures will be observed. Of course, you could observe some other signatures that we showed if the background is not inflation. So uh, just to give you a sketch again about the, what the signals might look like. Uh, so this is a very similar uh, sketch from the previous classical ones, uh, but now you don't have sharp feature signals. You, um, you only have uh, oscillatory uh, signals induced by the massive field. The Y axis is non gaussian entities and the X axis is the scale ratio K1 divided by K3. So, so sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but do you think you can wrap up maybe in five yeah, minutes? No. I only need one minute to wrap up. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, instead of uh, scale dependence in the previous classical case, here we have a shape dependence. All right, so uh, the detection of those experiments or constraint, constraint of those, those uh, predictions will also become more subtle. And uh, I will leave for interested reader uh, audience to the following works. Uh, um, the studies on how the mass and spin spectrums may be uh, measured by CMB larger surcharge and 21 centimeter. Thank you very much. Questions? Michael, you can go. Yeah, so, so thank you. I, I wanted to ask about the following. So, so we, we are looking at the CMB data and we're usually trying to relate it to some inflationary model, right? Some inflation, some, something beyond the, just the standard uh, slow roll potential. But why, why are, we, are we not also looking into BSM scenarios that happen during the CMB. For instance, if you have some non-classical field uh, rolling, some parametric resonances, some phase transitions, etc., these will give signals that that might look, I mean, similar in 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 essence in the fact that there's there will be perturbations, there will be some deviations from the CMB, and 
I mean, and different relations between the polarization data and the temperature data. So is there a reason why this is excluded or, or is it just that nobody has done this? Um, yeah, it's not excluded. Actually, closely related to uh, this talk. Um, uh, the approach I use in this talk is uh, very model independent. So if you introduce uh, uh, extra physics beyond standard model during the inflation that that will see a different uh, kind of primordial density perturbations in a CMB scale or larger structure scales. So they will be imprinted as some kind of primordial features and primordial non entities. So for example, the list of papers that I uh, li listed in, 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 in one of the slides, there are people studying what the signatures of uh, uh, ground unification and supersymmetry might right. be. But this is but this is at, at inflation, right? I mean, you could also have signatures at the CMB at something happening just oh. at, the, at the late universe. At, let's say recom oh. at recombination. Oh, you say you mean during the recombination? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So uh, those uh, signals signals will not be uh, super horizon. So so this is a, a good part. Sure, why, sure. This is the reason why we are so interested in. Um, uh, the in informations of uh, primordial de density perturbations. So those density perturbations are seeded way before the formation of the CMB. No, of course, of course, of course, yeah. I agree. But but you also in the CMB, you see subhorizon, you see modes that are subhorizon once, I mean, once you're looking at them, right? So, I mean, or at recombination, right? All the L equals 1,000, 2,000. These are, by the time you get to recombination, are already, uh, already subhorizon. So the question is, I mean, these can be affected by, by stuff happening at, at, at recombination. So um, I agree, the, the low L modes, yeah, they are, they are super horizon by the time of recombination, but, but, it's, but, but it's not necessarily true. I mean, for instance, if you have like, a, suppose you have like a phase transition at, at, the, at recombination, okay? Then you would have bubble formations and these will be, these will contribute to to the non inhomogeneities that you see in the CMB in a very non trivial way and 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 so you might say something about them or exclude them or i don't know look for them and i have never seen anyone look for this seriously only for oh. uh sure so th those considerations are not excluded at all uh, there are papers there are a lot of works um modifying the standard model uh, uh, process of the CMB formations by injecting, for example, extra energies um, uh, and studying how the CMB spectrum may be deformed by those kind of uh, uh, features. There are works on that. It, it, will, it will have a different uh, uh, character, characteristic properties. Yeah. But you're still having in mind. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, basically your question is what the CMB spectrum will be modified due to uh, beyond standard model fix during the recombination, right? So, so yeah. But 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 you are talking about modifying the original primordial spectrum, where exactly. whereas yeah. you can also generate a new spectrum, right? I mean, you can you can generate a a more inhomogeneities that have nothing to do with with the primordial one, like so if you have. If you have like a phase transition, right? This is one example. I agree. Yeah, you can modify uh, CMB spectrum in a different way if you have a physics in a late time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. Uh, I I think we are uh, very late. So uh, unless there is a, another uh, pressing question, we can move forward. And thanks, the speaker again. Yeah. Of course. Thank you.